Welcome to the first episode of World Ninja News. I'm Philip Scott, and each week, myself and Ken Casillas will take a dive into what's happening around the World Ninja League. Today's episode, we will be interviewing the winner of the Arnold Ninja Classic, Josiah Pipel. Hello everyone and welcome to World Ninja News, where we talk about all of the major upcoming events for the World Ninja League. I'm your host, Kane Casillas. First up, the Tier 2 division will be hosting their World Championships on April 1st and 2nd at Austin Ninjas in Cedar Park. The format will consist of a flow course, a full course, and two skills for all competitors across all divisions to compete on. Coming up after that on April 6th is the U2 premiere of Gauntlet 2. This was filmed back in July of 2022 and will finally be premiering on the World Ninja League's YouTube page. If you look on the screen right now, you'll see the dates and locations of multiple Tier 1 regionals for the World Ninja League. Those will be coming up and kicking off in May and going throughout the whole month. This will lead into June 23rd through the 25th for the Tier 1 World Championships at the Greensboro Coliseum. Level Up Fitness will also be hosting an international qualifier the day before on June 22nd. And finally, of course, the Barbados Ninja Throwdown has announced their 2023 date for September 2nd. No other real information is out at the moment, but we'll be sure to update you with that and more World Ninja news in our next segment. So a few weeks ago, we had the Arnold Classic at the Arnold Sports Festival. It was hosted by our gym, MLab Ohio, and we had a lot of people from all around the country fly out. Um, and we had a big elite tournament, uh, lots of crazy races, and the guy that came out on top was Josiah Papel. So how's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for coming, Josiah. It's great Thank having you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, hey, you killed it at that tournament. I saw, um, you know, the, it wasn't live streamed, but we did see a lot of your runs that you posted and that other competitors posted. Absolutely smashed it. Um, but I do have to ask, how different is it racing somebody as opposed to running on the course by yourself? So mentally, I think the difference is you have kind of an external factor pushing you. Like when I'm running courses, usually you have obviously yourself and the clock, but that's about it. Like I'm running at my own pace. Whereas when I'm racing somebody, I'm really running at a pace that's faster than them. So it doesn't really matter what my maximum pace is or what my minimum pace is. Like I always want to be faster than the person I'm racing. Yeah, that's great. And this course definitely gave you a lot of opportunity to be pretty speedy. Did you have any, any favorite obstacles on this course? Yeah. So I think in the qualifiers i definitely was testing out going faster in the first half because that's kind of how i like to run races i like to get out ahead in the beginning to keep pressure on them to um catch up because i feel like that's when people are going to make the most mistakes it's less when people are trying to chase you it's more when you're trying to chase somebody and get that extra step um and then going into the final semifinals, whatever um the kind of key bar or I bar or whatever that obstacle was called, that was where I made up a lot of time because I think I was one of the only ones who was very confident at the beginning, just jumping straight into it and hopping over rather than doing like a few hops and just slid it all the way down and hopped it over. So I think that's kind of where I gained a lot of advantage. Yeah. Looking at that obstacle, it was very, it, it was almost, I, when I first saw it, I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty techie for a, for a race course trying to fit it right in that slot there. So very, very impressive how you were able to just fully, like, just full send that. Yeah. And I think my mentality going into it was, like, at the end of the day, it, it this comp does matter. But, like, I've been trying to have the mentality of, like, I just want to have fun and just kind of send big moves. So I was just going to send that and whatever happened, happened. But I was still confident that, like, I could pull it off. It was just a matter of execution. Yeah. And if not, I mean, the format was double elimination, which meant that you did get to go into a loser's bracket if you did lose a race, which you didn't do. You just finessed the whole competition. But did it feel better knowing that you had a little bit of insurance in this competition? It did. But I think at the end of the day, like that's something you can't rely on because one, it's not always going to be there. And two, if you kind of have that mentality going into it of 
if I fall, I still get another chance. Like, I feel like I'd be more likely to fall because I feel like, oh, it doesn't matter as much. I'm not as focused on perfection. Makes sense. Makes sense. So something that I've noticed a lot um, with speed courses lately has been um, has been that there's a lot more um, upper body obstacles in speed <laughs> courses. Um, do you think, um, I, I know everybody has their own strengths and weaknesses. Uh, do you think that comes to your advantage um, more than others? Because I know that you're quite a bit of a burnout guy. So, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I do. I've, I've started to notice that a lot of speed courses are pretty much only upper body. And I think that is my strength only because like, as someone who's been training for NSN and training for burnouts and stuff, yeah. a lot of their courses are upper body intensive. So that's a lot of my training, but I do see like benefit in training lower body obstacles. Like I think that's another area I pulled ahead at the Arnold was on the um, agility or balance or whatever you want to call it. I was one of the only ones who was really confident just kind of running it and not really treating it as a balance obstacle, but just kind of striding across it and kind of letting it take me where I was going to go rather than like really focusing on pushing the theater totter down. Like I just kind of sprinted across it. And that just comes with the confidence of having trained agility and balance obstacles. Right. There's a benefit to training both, but yeah, I definitely think upper body obstacles suit me better. And it also, I mean, how tall are you again? Uh, I'm six one. Yeah, so that stride definitely does help a little bit too, for sure. Yeah. But I, I totally get what you mean. Lots of lots of training, lots of experience. So yeah, and I had to benefit on both upper body and lower body obstacles. Obviously, the stride, but then the reach on the upper body is too, is a big help too. And you had a pretty tall opponent in the championship as well. You faced Tyler Smith in the finals. Uh, break down that run for me. Yeah, so I mean, kind of going into it. The person I was most scared to race was Tyler um, because I've just seen him at NSN. I know he doesn't burn out on burnouts and he doesn't slow down on speed courses. So I knew that like of all the people, obviously Sam and Phil and everybody else there was going to be a big opponent, but I think Tyler was going to be the closest opponent. And I mean, it did work out to that. Like he was obviously at the end of the day in the championship with me. So I kind of took that last race as I'm going to go all out like, no stopping. And even in my first race with him, I think that's why that was the only race of the day that I, the only time of the day that I fell. Um, and I think the reason was I knew that I had to push to the absolute limit and that's when mistakes happen. He also was sent down to the loser's bracket, which meant he had to do an extra race before the championship. Do you think that was more of an advantage for him or a disadvantage? I think it would have been an advantage if it was different courses or like slight modifications every time. But I think because it was the same course and we all had a lot of experience on it at that point, um, I think it was probably a disadvantage because obviously I'm getting a break in between that race and he has to run another race after just running a race. So I had a lot more rest than he did going into the final round, which I guess would be a benefit of being in the winner's bracket. But yeah, I think... For him, it was probably a disadvantage to have to run an extra race. Phil? <laughs> he's, yeah. he's staring very intensely. <laughs> yeah, so some that's a, that's a good point about the rest because that's something that I've always debated, uh, even as when I was competing, is how much of when I see these races, these race format comps, well, I sometimes I wonder is arrest as much of an advantage as i think it is like i it, it's always a funny balance for me because so it's interesting that you've said that it, it you think it was an advantage because sometimes i feel like it depends on the course because like sometimes i've noticed you know if i like to just be fresh and go right away again yeah i think for me personally like i prefer rest almost between speed courses rather than like a stage three type course or because those are usually more slower muscle intensive and you can shake out and that's kind of your rest and like in between you don't need terribly much because you can kind of just keep going at your own pace but with speed courses where you're sprinting all out for even just 30 seconds like by the end you're still out of breath so you need to like come back reset and it takes a little while for the heart rate to go back down yeah that's true definitely I, I, that is a good point though, because I noticed that 
it depends on the style of course like you said sometimes i'll do like a two three minute long course and i'll be like ready to go again but sometimes i'll be doing a 20 second speed course and i'm just dead so <laughs> yeah yeah i feel like anything that's going to be like short but really fast is just going to naturally be what's going to tie you out more than even something that's like five minutes but you're taking it super slow and just going mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So if you had to give any advice to anyone trying to train for speed courses, what would you what would you tell them? I think first and foremost, like the mentality of being able to mess up and just being okay with that is very important. Like the mentality of like having knowing that like it's not your last comp, even if you don't do well. Um and just the ability to give it your all first try. Because I think a lot of people, when it's the first time on an obstacle, they want to kind of take it slow and kind of feel it out. Whereas with speed comps, like you have someone next to you, so you don't really have that time. So just train whenever you're doing a new obstacle, always give it your all first try and always treat it like you have to get through it as fast as possible and not just get through it. So we've seen a lot of different racing events in the last year or so. You know, you, we, we've been we've had Wolfpack, you've competed in Gauntlet. Uh, and now you've done the Arnold. Do you do you think that head-to-head racing is a good direction for the sport to be moving in? Yeah, I think for a spectator it is as an athlete. I mean, I like the racing, but I'd much prefer kind of slightly longer style courses that are a little bit longer in time limit as well. I don't think they have to be like four-minute courses, but I think somewhere around like a minute, 30, two minutes, where you're still moving quick, but it's not like a 30-second speed course. Um, but I definitely think like for spectators, the speed and the racing is what people want to watch. So I think that's kind of the direction the sport's going in. Yeah. It'd be crazy if, I mean, who knows, we could see it on our screen someday. Yeah, definitely. So obviously the Arnold, uh, just happened, uh, pretty soon we're going to have the World Ninja League regionals. Um, I believe you'll be competing at the, uh, center court regional and, uh, is that center court? Yeah. yeah, it's center court. Yeah. It's center yeah. Court. Um, and then we will be heading into the world championships in June. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How are you preparing? Yeah, so I'm actually not competing at the center court regional because I qualified through Gauntlet, I believe. That's true. So, right. I, I and if design. not, if not, he would have qualified through the Arnold anyways. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's true. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of on the design team for the center court one because I've been training there a lot. Gotcha. And then, yeah, so going into worlds, like, Obviously, last year I missed out on stage three by 0.06 seconds. So, like, I have that motivation because, and then I tested three. So, and I would have like been world champion. Obviously, assuming that if they let Sam move on to, he didn't beat me. Yeah. But um, like I tested three and got further than anyone else who was competing on three. So I kind of feel like gypped, but like motivated to be like, all right, I know I can be world champion, but I gotta like pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And think, you were uh, you were talking about course design there for for center court. What's what's some what's your mindset as you try to approach making obstacles not only for um, athletes your age but athletes of different ages and different skill levels? So I'm kind of just like a course tester and course designer, like consulting. But um, I think the kind of best way to design courses is to first like design obstacles that you feel like you would like, and then kind of adapt them because I think a lot of people try and design obstacles for everybody at first and I think the best way to do it is design the obstacles you want to design and then go from there rather than because like it's a lot harder to start by making the perfect course it's a lot easier to set up a course and then be like okay we got to change this we got to change this so I think kind of just setting up what you think you would prefer and then work from there to a course that is kind of good for everybody. Yeah, it, the course design is very interesting because you know, all the reasons that you said, like making something that you like, it, it's so hard to start from square one. I remember oh, I remember last year when we started making the world's course last year, um, I remember I was trying to make one starting from making a kid's course going up and that was the worst decision ever and I could not even so I um so this year it was a lot uh, we obviously ended up actually like starting from late and going back down but um 
Yeah, actually this, uh, right after this, I'm going to be uh, finalizing in the last obstacle of uh, Worlds after I hop off this call, so yeah. Are there, uh, are there any obstacles you're hoping to see, Josiah? Ooh. Well, I mean, obviously I want to get to the vertical limit again on three after two years ago. Um, which again, they've had it for the past like four or five years. So I'm assuming it'll be in there again, hopefully. Um, other than that, like, I feel like it's nice to see new obstacles. So like, there aren't necessarily obstacles I want to see, just new obstacles, new stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. World Ninja League's had some absolute bangers for original obstacles. I remember when special delivery was introduced, it blew up. It went everywhere. Yeah. That was all I would go on Instagram and, and those were the only videos I would see. So I, I'm excited to see what, what Phil and, and the rest of the crews got cooking. Want to bring back the original monster swing. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I was the only one to static it. So I, I, I can't complain about it. I loved it. It was, I, I thought it was very underrated because everybody hated it so much. But I feel like in 2023, you know, I think that a lot you, better. You, oh, would, yeah. you would definitely see more success, way more success on that one. Um, and also maybe even the swivel steps. I mean, you, you would see it, but I, yeah, I, I do, do think, I do think that there are modifications that have to be made to that one slightly. I think if they locked, it would definitely be a lot exactly. better. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I it, it's actually funny how much courses have evolved. I, Cause like, yeah. I, I just looking at some old Thompson stuff, like, I, it's it's really crazy just in such a slow such a such short amount of time you know we got like i i think it's just because of all just how many of the teens have just started to grow up and come into the elite division it's just it's just since like 2019 i would say it's just gone just it's expanded so much just the difficulty yeah and i think like even sometimes i'll look at courses from like two years ago even last year and be like Wow, that's like I can't believe I failed that. Like that's like an easy course for me. Yeah. So like, easy to see the progression in such a short amount of time. Definitely. Like now we got now we just now bear traps are like regular, <laughs> regular yeah. staples. And... <laughs> Three years ago, somebody like put a bear trap and cane tech in a comp, like nobody would be able to do it. Oh know? yeah. Like, the sky bar and it was on the same truss. Like it was like yeah. one move and like nobody was getting it. Oh and yeah. Now, that People are doing yeah. like 10-foot sky bar moves easily. Yeah, I remember that. That was UNX season one, I think, or something. It was like, yeah, it was just normal flying bar and sky bar. Everybody <laughs> Yeah, nobody knew how to do it. Honestly, yeah, that's just like, especially, I think you can see it just as much as me or anyone else, you know, because, I mean, you've been training as long as I have, but like 10 years at this point, so... Yeah, I think, like, back when I started, like, being able to do the salmon ladder was, like, cool. Like, if you could do the salmon ladder, like, that was so cool. Yeah. And now, like, I feel like if you can't do, like, a quad with a bar spin and Superman <laughs> and whatever, like, yeah. it's like, oh, okay, that's not yeah. that cool. But Yeah, I was I was so proud of myself, like, a couple months ago for finally getting a triple transfer. <laughs> I mean, hey, that's still impressive, okay? I just started training a couple months ago, and so I'm I'm still working at it, but... I'm just impressed by anyone who can do any of this. You guys are you guys are absolute beasts. So, what would you say is your favorite ops like style of obstacle? Like, what category of obstacle? Like, I don't know, cliffhangers, sand ladders. What would you say is yeah, your favorite? You know, it really depends on where it is. Like, I prefer more staticky cliffhanger obstacles on the show, but mm -hmm. when it's in like WNL or any other competition. I like more bar tech obstacles mm. because I feel like when the show has bar tech obstacles, they're always kind of weird and they're ba they're very showy, like yeah. always very hard. They're just, they just, they're supposed to look good. Whereas mm -hmm. you have like competitions like NSN, WNL and whatever you get more unique and more difficult bar tech obstacles. So yeah, yeah. I think like the show any like cliffs and stuff I like, but then bar tech or like cane tech in regular competition. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, are there any obstacles that you'd that you're that you'd like to come back? Like it, trends from the past that you'd like to come back like nowadays Ooh. that you think people don't train enough of now. 
that's tough because like I feel like we're like so focused on the sport moving forward that like mm -hmm. almost forget about trends that are past. I'm trying to think of any that I can even think of. Yeah. One thing that I've noticed um a lot uh recently is people haven't really been doing nunchuck type obstacles. Yeah, I would agree. I think vertical grip is definitely becoming kind of underrated. Yeah. But I can see that making a comeback. Mm -hmm. And I can also see like I feel like people have stopped doing slow technical balance. Mm -hmm. Like that was like way always way harder than agility. So I feel like someone's got to bring back like some crazy slow tech balance. All right. Let me just say that uh, Chris, you you know Chris always has preferred slow tech balance over yeah. over agility. So I, I you might see it someday return at worlds or something. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Hint, hint, wink, wink, little, little nod, <laughs> nod to everybody from Phil. <laughs> may or may not. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we should do that. We should do an episode like everything that you should practice before Worlds. <laughs> but we just, but we just throw everyone off. And we have you, to train just the wrong way. Interrogate me into reviewing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll just, it'll just be me and you, and I'll just grill you for as many, as many different leaks on on obstacles as possible. <laughs> but no, I totally get that because. Um, I'm the new kid on the block at, at my home gym and everyone else has been training five years or more, pretty much mm -hmm. um, aged, I don't know, 10 to 45, something like that. Like they're, they're up there and they're like, yeah, man, I, I haven't run up a warped wall in, in four months. I haven't, I haven't trained anything like that because we just, it, we've moved on and we're, we're now trying to do special deliveries attached to springs and, uh, a big dipper into like nunchucks and linking it into like multiple nunchucks or UFOs. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's so different now. And I'm over here trying to, I'm just happy I got up the salmon ladder once, you know, but it's, it's crazy because um, where I see a lot of, a lot of people trying, especially on cliffhangers, lots of really flashy moves. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think, looking back like we just had a competition over at level up uh, a couple weeks ago and um a lot of really really talented athletes were failing some really basic obstacles just because they were being careless they they took it for granted and i think yeah. that's i think that's something that um that could definitely come back to haunt people especially at something like worlds when um when so many new things but familiar concepts could be thrown at them yeah and i think for me like I always go into it with the mindset of like, take nothing for granted. Like, even if it's like the most simple obstacle, like still treat it like it's the hardest obstacle. Cause when you start to take things for granted, like that's when mistakes happen. And I also think like on the subject of obstacles, like if Ninja evolving, I think when you look at like a lot of the obstacles now, a lot of it tends to be obstacles from the past, but just like to the extreme, I feel uh, like. Yes. So, like it's all, it's no longer just cliffhanger. It's who can do the smallest cliffhanger or who can do the biggest cliffhanger throw and who can do the highest warp wall. Like it's no longer just the warp wall, it's mega walls and who can do the highest mega wall and who can do the farthest to or who can skip the most on salmon ladder. And so I feel like when you see moves that are just traditional, but like small and precise rather than these huge moves, that's where people mess up. Like I've, there's obviously people who like, are really good at tech, bar tech, small bar tech, Phil, Sam, Tyler, just to name a few. But I feel like in general, Ninja's like moving to a lot more big and flashy moves. So it's the small technical moves that are going to take people out. Right. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, not every competitor can do those moves, especially outside of the elite division. You know, there are definitely a, a good amount of, of adults and, and young adults and, and teens that definitely could and probably should go up to elite in the coming seasons. Um, but finding that balance on the courses between how do I stump those guys and how do I still make it fair to where everyone else who's not at that level in other divisions isn't just going to get destroyed by the same two moves every competition. I think that's, yeah. that's a very tough balance to find. Yeah. And I think that comes with like kind of time designing courses and, the ability to kind of see course progression where like you're like okay i want to kind of have an easier first half and then a crux and then a harder second half and then a harder crux yeah so what, what 
what does your uh, just for um kind of as advice if people are curious about you know how you train and stuff what what does your usual training routine look like what do you do over the week and stuff so again it really depends on time of year and what i'm training for but for instance right now i'm training for the show and i'm training late nights five to six times a week so i usually go in monday afternoon and then monday nights and then thursday tuesday or thursday i'll hit center court so mo monday night and monday afternoon at m lab tuesday or thursday i'll hit center court and whichever day i don't i'll go rock climbing and then wednesday another um morning and afternoon or morning and night session at m lab so besides rock climbing and, and obstacle training, do you do any other type of cross training? Um, so not really. Um, at Center Court, I've been training a lot with Adam Latz, James Sinell, and Isaiah. But um, we've done some weight training, like not like bench press type weight training, but like a lot of just weight vests and pull-ups kind of deals. Mm. Weight vests, pull-ups on cliffhangers, stuff. So stuff that's still ninja-y, but more um, kind of calisthenics. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I've actually noticed a lot more, um, a lot more people do more cross training nowadays. I know that's what I've noticed. Like it, like, uh, you, you probably, I know about just as an example of vitality, you know, <laughs> Jordan Thurston makes him do all sorts of crazy cardio and weight stuff, you know? So it, it, I think the, and of course, you know, of course, uh, Naj does CrossFit now. So yeah, but I think you can kind of see that it pays off too. Like Vitality is an absolute force. Like, I all of their athletes are at the top. Like, I yes. think most gyms just like want you. They have the one or two athletes that are at the top. But like, I really can't think of many elite athletes from Vitality that aren't like the best of the best. And and so you say you do this about five to six days a week. So I do have to ask because if I was if I was doing this five six days a week, my shoulder would pop out. How are you avoiding injury here? Yeah, so it's five to six times a week now. Five, so oh. it's over four days still. Okay, but um, because some days I double up. But yeah, I think like it's important stretching, kind of recovery, Theragun. That's really good, and nutrition as well. My mom's a dietitian, so that helps. Yeah, I went to. Uh, I, I had a background in in running, um, in high school and in college, and I went to this. I went to this camp uh, led by uh, Jim Ryan. He was an Olympian runner. And they, they were having a bunch of professionals come in. And, and the only thing that we really took away from the diet part was the saying, sugar is Satan. And that is, that is it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I think in small like doses, it's fine to have, like, especially like it's good. So like, as long as it's not in excess and it's every meal is like super high in sugar, that's fine. But yeah, like as a small thing, every once in a while, I think it's fine, especially like mentally like to give yourself a reward yeah like that's important as well i that that's something i've uh it that's good to hear like uh, interesting to hear how you recover and stuff because i've i've something i've always wondered is with this you know new generation of ninja like <laughs> it was surely they've got to be feeling it you know <laughs> yeah definitely and i have like gone through things i've had a knee thing i had an ankle injury for a while and like a shoulder thing and training with adam Latz has actually been a real help because like a lot of people don't realize that the way you do workouts and the way you do certain exercises like affects how it affects your body. So like he's having us do pull-ups in a certain way to protect our shoulders and stuff that like I just wouldn't think of before. So it's been really helpful to have somebody who's like knowledgeable about that. And I think that's really important to like for people to know how to train not only safely in the sense of like mats and rigging, but safely in the sense of like how to protect your body. Closing thoughts, Josiah? I mean, guys, thank you for having me. It was super fun. Um, hopefully, I'll be back at the Arnold next year. It'd be nice to have yeah, another time. But, um, yeah, thanks for having me. Great questions. Yeah. If you, I, ever, if you ever want to do another podcast, let me know. Absolutely, man. Hey, oh, yeah. thank you for being our first guest. This, is, this was awesome. I'm very excited for the episode to drop. And I look forward to seeing you at Worlds in a couple of months, tearing it up. So I wish you the best of luck with that. Uh, and of course, to everyone else, uh, thank you guys for watching. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with episode two, hopefully, if Chris says that this is going to be a series. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> You're each going to do your best impersonation of Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice. And whoever I decide is the best wins. You gotta give us like a line. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know what? We'll give you, a, j just give me the two. I'll be back, get to the chopper. I'll be back. I'll, I'll be chopper. back. Get to the chopper. <laughs> get to the chopper. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that goes to Phil. I, I think for the enthusiasm, I'm gonna give it to Phil. Yeah, <laughs> but.